Thank you so much, church. You can be seated this morning. It is good to be in the house of God today. Always um, an honor and a blessing to be back at the Oasis. Uh, my starting to become not my home away from home, but my my home, my other home home. And um, it's just an honor. It's a great honor to stand in this pulpit and to be a part of what God is doing here. But how many of you know it's an honor to be a part of what God is doing in the earth right now? Amen. That, um, you know, you and I could have been born at any time, but he entrusted us with this time. And, uh, and he set us into time carrying a treasure of greater glory in earthen vessels as the word uh, describes it. And that's what you and I are. And uh, so it's an honor to, uh, to be a part of God's great campaign in the earth and to be here for such a time as this. Amen. I am uh, also greatly looking forward to um, this time this evening. I have uh, caught Eric, which I'm sure many of you have on the news and different places. And Pastor Tim and I were just talking about there's just there's such an edge to his voice and what he is bringing. And uh, so exciting things are happening in our midst. And I'm really just so delighted to get to be smack in the middle of it. Amen. Well, let's pray over the word this morning, and uh, we're going to get into what God has for us today. Father, we do thank you for all that you are doing and moving at this time in history. We thank you, Father, that you sit on the throne of heaven, but Father, you are very much engaged in real time. And Lord, we look to you this morning for your words and what you would have to speak to us, Father, for this age, for our world, for our nation, for our cities, and also for our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you are never caught without a plan. Nothing has ever taken you by surprise. Father, that you are still the one that laid the foundations of this world we are living in. And that, Jesus, you are the author and the finisher of all things. We thank you, Lord, that we are standing in the work of the finishing process of what you began when you spoke the world into existence. That we are living out the finishing process of when you spoke us into existence. And so today, Lord, we come for revelation, for impartation that we might hear your word and run with it. And we thank you for this very thing. In your mighty name we pray, and everyone said, amen and amen. Well, I want to start this morning by sharing with you a particular dream that I've had recently. It was a peculiar kind of dream because I dreamed something that I actually experienced. It was like uh, dreaming or reliving in my dream uh, something that I had walked out, walked through. And uh, when I awoke in the days preceding, I knew that God was speaking a word to me. And, And the dream that I had was something that had happened to me quite a few years ago now. And it was when I had had my one and only car accident. And I plan on this keeping the record as my one and only car accident. And it it happened on um, the middle of the summer, and it had been very, very hot. And um, it had rained really hard all that afternoon. That evening, um, early evening, I was getting in my car actually to go to a service, And uh, I was going down sort of a a country road that was a little bit on an incline, coming to a stop sign to make a turn onto a main route. And when I was coming down the incline of that hill, what I didn't know is that because of the heat of the summer days, that a, a puddle of oil had compiled at the base of that hill right at that stop sign. And so as I came down um, that gradient hill and hit that oil, rather than stopping, I slid on that oil right through that stop sign right out into that main route. 
If you've ever been a part of something like that, you know that it feels like everything goes in slow motion, but in actuality, in milliseconds, you think and do a lot of things. And so it seemed like I was in slow motion. I remember it dawning on me what was happening and that it seemed I slowly turned to my left to look out my driver window to see what this was going to mean. And as I turned out that window to look, I saw a dumpster truck heading right for me. The next thing that I remembered was the impact. At the time, I was driving a small four-door Toyota sedan, and it was probably headed for 200,000 miles, because if you ever had an old Toyota, they they just won't die. And uh, so being in this tiny car, I took the impact driver's side and the driver's side door of that dump truck. It pushed me out into the other lane where I then hit the corner of another car that was coming another way, which spun me around and I landed in a ditch. Of course, my airbag went off and the first miracle was that, first of all, I was still conscious from going through this. I remember catching my breath and immediately trying to get a sense of what state I was in in my person realizing that I I could seemingly move all my limbs. Nothing seemed to be broken to me, and a lot of activity started happening. People ran to check on me. Someone had called in the accident, and so the paramedics came, the ambulance came. I had a couple of close friends that lived nearby, and, uh, and they came and were there at the scene with me. They took me to the local hospital to get checked out, And I remember having to move around from place to place as they began to take x-rays to check my limbs and my organs and see what was going on. By that time, what I didn't know is that my uh, family had arrived at the scene of the accident just as the tow truck was coming to tow away my vehicle And when my family walked up to find out where they were towing it, and they said that they were the family of the person driving it, the the tow truck driver immediately began to apologize and said, I'm so sorry for your loss. My family said, oh, well, you know, we appreciate it, but actually she's, she's, intact as much as we know. She's conscious. She's, we're going there right now. She's being checked out. And the driver looked at my family son, and he said, I've been doing this for a living for over 20 years. And he said, I'm looking at this car, and nobody survives this kind of accident. After being moved to room and having x-rays and sort of hobbling from place to place. And I remember sitting in the examination room and, and uh, all that they had really treated so far was a few cuts on my face from the glass in the driver's side window bursting. And, and I had a few cuts there. Finally, the doctor came in. And he came in with the x-rays and all the scans. And he said, I can hardly believe that I'm telling you this, but everything has come back totally fine, and you don't have a thing wrong with you. He said, other than having taken the, the impact of that blow, of that hit, your, your body is going to be all right. He said, you'll probably be sore for a little bit, but you will make a full recovery. Of course, I was so grateful, and and I got up to gather my things to leave, and as I did, I sort of was hobbling a bit, sort of limping toward the door, and my friends that were there were helping me, and I was moving kind of slow, and and I remember getting ready to walk out, and all of a sudden, the, the doctor spoke up, and this portion of what I experienced came back in technicolor in my dream. The doctor stopped me and he said, Miss Jennifer, what are you doing? And I I said, well, I thought you said I could go. He said, no, why are you limping? And I said, well, I think it's just taking that that blow, the hit of that impact. You know, it just, uh, you said I would be kind of sore. And he said, 
don't tolerate the limp. If you settle for the limp, you will actually cause a problem that isn't even there. And I remember saying, well, you know, doctor can, I mean, this just happened to me. Can I have a little bit of time? I just took the blow of a dump truck on my left side. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. You can't allow yourself to settle for the limp. When I woke up from having that dream and hearing the words of that doctor play back to me, it was as if I heard the voice of the father saying, this is a word for my church and for America right now. Don't settle for the limp. Don't settle for a lame America. Don't settle for a lame status quo. Don't settle for the conditions as they are and say, well, it, it could be worse. At least we're still functional. At least we can still go on with our daily lives. And, and even though it's not great, we'll just go on in this state. But the heart of the Father this morning is that he has deemed this time a time of reformation, of reforming and restoration. And he is looking for a people that will rise up and say, we will not settle for a lame America. We won't settle for a, a limping state of things. When Jesus, the restorer, the redeemer, and the repairer is calling us to partner with him for something more. I want to read to you a few different translations of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. In the New King James, I'm sorry, verse 12. In the New King James Version, it says, Therefore strengthen the hands that hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. It says, but let it rather be healed. The NIV says, make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. The New American, make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is impaired may not be dislocated but rather to be healed. Maybe my favorite is the Amplified. It says, cut through, make firm and plain and smooth paths for feet to walk on so that the lame and halting limb may not be put out of joint, but rather let it be cured. Today, what I believe heaven is bringing before us is something that carries the tone of a charge to you and I as believers saying, don't settle for a lame America, but rather let it be healed. Don't settle for a lame and a broken world. And this speaks directly to the task at hand of our generation. If our generation has a specific task, it is this. And this is a prophetic word for us this morning from the heart of the Father that he wants us to pick up. Why? Because we are the ones, we the church, are charged with making disciples of nations. This isn't a political point of view. This isn't because we believe that we are, we are nationalists and that this is the gospel we preach. It is because it is in the gospel that we believe. That we are the ones tasked with the discipling of nations. In December of 2023, Time Magazine released an article entitled, 2024 is not just an election year. It is perhaps the election year of all years. The reason that it said that is because globally more voters than ever in history all over the world will head to the polls 
as at least 64 countries, including the European Union, are meant to hold national elections. 64 countries have national elections in 2024. The results of which, for many, will prove consequential for years to come. That's Time Magazine's words. With 64 countries holding national elections, that represents a combined population of about 49% of the people in the entire world. Taiwan, they will have a presidential election this year that will fundamentally shape their approach to democracy, a country which is repeatedly threatened with invasion. There are national elections in India, Indonesia, Russia, Mexico, South Africa, the Republic of Korea, the former South Korea, the Ukraine, Sri Lanka, Romania, Cambodia, and the list goes on and on. Why does this matter to us? Because Psalms chapter 2 verse 8 matters to us. It says, ask of me and I will give you the nations. The whole earth will be yours. Ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. Ask of me for the unborn promises of my word that seem unlikely in the natural. Become my partner and release my promise. The writer of the book of Hebrews was writing to all of the church at large in Hebrews 12. And he used the picture of an individual runner to symbolize the entire body of Christ. And he also symbolized God's plan and purposes in the earth as a race that this runner was to run. This speaks of us right now in our generation, and he's asking us to pick it up. The truth is we could easily get overwhelmed with what's going on in the election world, in the political realm. We could easily get overwhelmed with what even the, the liberal media is calling the moral decline of America. You know it's bad when they're saying it. We could get overwhelmed with the, the state of our media and supposed news outlets, all of this leaving us to feel helpless. But hear me this morning, the church is not meant to live as the victims of a timeline. But in partnership with God, we are called to make history and write the future. It has been said, God's not looking for a people that will predict the future as much as God is looking for a people that will partner with him in his plan and create the future with him using his words. You can hear the reverberation of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 42 when he said, Behold, the former things they've come to pass. In other words, yeah, it does look bleak. It is what it is. He said, But new things I now declare. And before they spring forth, I tell them to you, that is why God is saying, don't settle for the limp. Don't settle for a lame America. I want to partner with you. God wants to partner with somebody that will release his word, that will release a new day. God wants to partner with the people that will not settle for a lame existence. A lame Christianity, a lame government, a lame education system, but a people who would raise their hands in voice and prayer saying, let that which is lame be healed. A people that will not settle for any place of personal lameness. In the book of Acts, there's this story of Peter and John on their way to a conference. And they're in the middle of the day and they come upon this man who is lame. The Bible says he was lame at birth. And every day they set him at the gate beautiful 
to beg for money. He's not there looking for a cure. He's just dealing with his circumstance. This is a man that had settled for lameness. And he was doing what humanity does outside of God. Humanity decides to cope instead of looking for a cure. And this man was doing just that. And when he came upon Peter and John and he asked them to help him with his coping, if you could just give me money to meet my need, Peter and John infamously answered in him and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give to you. I'm not here to help you cope. God's saying, I'm not here to help you cope with America. I want to heal America. This is the day of a cure. When you look up the word lame, it it means a halt, a limp, or something that cripples. What I found out about what that doctor told me is something that psychologists and particularly sports psychologists know. Today in modern day professional sports, most professional sports team now have a sports psychologist on their staff as part of their physical therapy teams because it has been discovered that almost 40% of physical injury recovery is beliefs what you think about, and your emotions surrounding it. Many pro athletes struggle with getting the injury they experienced out of their mental perception. It tries to become the new version of who they are and dictate what they can now do. I read a report where one sports psychologist was quoted as saying, the mental halt delays the progress of the body healing. So much so that at times, even once the injury has healed, the athlete has a hard time believing it has healed and will continue walking and running and performing as if the injury still exists. The psychologist went on to say, it is essential to regain movement. Otherwise, the limp becomes the brain's new norm, almost like a default setting. And once it is locked in, it can be very hard to reverse. A limp is also defined in Webster's Dictionary as, listen to this, a protective walking pattern meant to put limitations on you that the hurt you experience would become a halt in your mind and take you off course from what God has planned for your life. This morning, God is reminding us that the enemy of our soul would want us to believe that the wounds of the past are eternal, that the triggers are forever, that the limp is permanent so that you will adjust to a protective walking pattern. You can see this trying to pervade the mentality of our current times. And even in the church world, there has to be a purposeful shrugging off to not go into protective mode. That America's going down, and so I must just protect my own, me, myself, and I must protect my children rather than prepare them to go into a world and be salt and light rather than allow it to be lame, be a part of the solutionaries that bring the cure. See, we have to see what's really going on when attack or injury or we're hurt or wounding or life experience comes, we take a hit unexpectedly that we didn't see coming. We have to see what's really going on, that the pain, the loss, the disappointment, the broken trust isn't the real play of the enemy here. The strategy for the attack is that you will live in the confines of the injury for the rest of your life. That you will shift from experiencing pain to now believing you are forever disabled. 
That's what the enemy would like us to believe about the state of things right now, that the disease of our culture would get us to believe that we are a disabled people. He would like us to believe that the things we've gone through in life now dictate our capabilities and what we're capable and not capable of doing. This is why the Hebrew writer warns us, don't do this. Don't let the hurt dislocate you. Today, we have many who once sat among us in our churches and share their experience of what many times gets the label put on it as church hurt. I wrote a piece about this last year that got published. I talked about how there are things that people have gone through in their church experiences for whatever reason, and the, and the hurt for some is real. But there is also the truth that for many it is a misconception. Regardless, the genuine pain felt is really all just a veiled attempt to dislocate you. And God is saying, rather than be dislocated, to quote Pastor Tim in Rachel's book, come home. Let that which is lame be healed. I love how the Mirror Bible says it in Hebrews 12, verse 13. Don't let a recurrent injury force you out of the race. Why? Because the enemy's play here is that there would be no more praying, no more believing, no more seeking, let alone seeking first, no more vision, no more giving, no more bold leaps of faith, no more connecting, no more relationship, no more trust, that there would be a protective walking pattern that would shut you down. And so the Hebrew charge to us is ringing loud and clear today. Make level paths for your feet, church, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather let it be healed. That word healed there is a very specific word. It actually means to cure. When he says rather let it be healed, it means let it be restored to soundness. To get rid of harmful and undesirable conditions. To heal, to cure, it means to let there be a mending of the breach. God is saying to us this morning, don't settle for the limp. Take ground. You are a redeemed runner. You weren't created and redeemed to live a life of being triggered from past injuries or to put up with the halt in your step. Don't adjust to the limp, but rather let it be cured. In fact, I believe that heaven is saying for many of us, these things that you experienced were so long ago and I've had you in the process of healing and recovering you. He's saying, look, if you'll look, you'll see I've actually healed you. Let that which was lame, that let that which you have been protecting, let it be healed and see, see that you are healed. You are, you are whole. You're not like the, the blow-up doll that is partially been deflated by the blows of life. If you'll see, I've restored you back to soundness. You're actually standing in wholeness again. There's no need to protect yourself anymore. As we stand at this crucial threshold in our world and in our nation, everyone is agreeing that we are experiencing a seismic shift in America. This is why we must walk in healing ourselves because we cannot give what we do not have. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, I'd like to read to you out of the mirror translation. It begins, so now the stage is set for us. All of these faith heroes 
that have gone before us are cheering us on. They are the cloud of witnesses, as it were, like a great multitude of spectators in an amphitheater. And this is our moment. As with a runner who is determined to win, it would be silly to carry any baggage of the old ways of life or the old law system that would weigh you down. Make sure you do not get your feet clogged up with sin consciousness or an awareness of your past. Become absolutely streamlined in faith now and run the race of your spiritual life with total persuasion. He's charging us to run to be a light, a light like a city set on a hill. He's charging us with the charge of being salt, a stabilizing force, with the charge to be the ecclesia, a legislative body of Jesus, bringing his kingdom life into every part of our world, to be heaven's solutionaries in our generation. I believe this word is specifically calling upon younger generations in the body of Christ that are maybe just now showing up to the battle. Maybe they're just now aware of the state of the world around them. Even though generations, some of us have been at this a while, they're showing up, but really they're showing up just in time. Because where there could be danger, that we might settle for a little limp, they're showing up to the battlefront like David. And they're pointing out and saying, who, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Why is the sound of the state of things and the taunt ringing in your ears? Wait, wait, wait. Why are we settling here? Like David, they're showing up and saying, no, no, no. Why would we settle for the limp? When greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Like David, a generation is showing up to pray prayers and they actually believe that every time they pray, things happen. Every time things change. A generation is rising up praying that when we step out and we do what God shows us to do, when we move out in prophetic acts, that it's not some crazy cult or sect of some wild thing we do to make us feel good, that prophetic acts are taking movements from heaven, bringing into the earth that change things in the natural. They're a generation that believes that when God says, go dump salt in the water, prophet of God, that the waters change and what was putrefied is healed. Zechariah chapter 4 in verse 8. And the NIV says, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house and his hand shall also finish it. And they'll shout and know that the Lord of hosts has set himself upon you. For who has despised the day of small things, says the Lord, for they shall rejoice and they shall see the capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. I believe that God is reminding us this morning, don't succumb to the small thing syndrome. That we are to take on the attitude of faith, of the prophetic word to Zerubbabel that says, who are you, what are you, O mountain, that you would dictate the state of our nation? Is it possible that God is still using everyday men and women to pray bold prayers, to declare bold things that actually change nations? Have we come to a generation that would regress into believing that you have to be known or famous or popular, that you have to be a specific one? to stand and declare the word of God and see things change? Or are we one of the redeemed runners 
that believes that the Spirit of God is upon his bride and that the body of Christ is a prophetic voice that rises up and says, be healed in the name of Jesus. Is it not true that every time we pray, things change? Is it not true that every time God shows us something to do, that when we act in obedience, his power comes on the scene? I can recall times throughout my life in the early days of of ministry when unknown to anyone, even after it happened, no one knew. What seemed like a small thing, I watched play out and become a big, big thing. This year, God gave me personally a a mandate to be aware of going global this year. In June, I'll be going back to the nation of Grenada in the fall. I'll be going to the European nations. In preparing for that, I was reminded of the first time that I went over to uh, Great Britain to minister. When I was on the plane flying over there to speak at, at one women's conference and return, I was getting quiet in my heart and suddenly the Lord spoke to me and he said, there's more to this trip than meets the eye. I haven't sent you just to go speak at this conference, but there's some things in the spirit that I'll have you do and you'll know when you get there. Well, I held that close to my heart, but there really wasn't much of an understanding of what to do with it as I hit the ground and the conference schedule took off and and it was very busy throughout the days and When we got to the third day, they were taking me to lunch and we went into this shopping center and they said, well, our, our, our reservation isn't ready, but would you like to go around the corner and, and see something we think will be of interest to you right around the corner from the shopping center is the first church that John Wesley ever built. And it was in this place that Revival began to break out in Great Britain years ago. I said, oh yeah, I'd like to see that. Having nothing more than an interest in the history of it and what happened there, as we were walking, suddenly the Spirit of God came upon me unknown to anyone else, just as real as when I was on the plane, and he said, this is the moment I was talking to you about. He said, when you walk in, to this place where my spirit broke out once before. I want you to stand in this place and I want you to declare my power and my strength to the government of this nation. At that time, Great Britain was right in the middle of trying to make their way out of the European Union, what we now know as Brexit. And a report had come out about the prime minister at that time, Theresa May, leading the charge and there were reports in the papers everywhere I went. It said that uh, the, the plea to leave Brexit was going to fall apart because Theresa May was limping. When I walked into that chapel, and the guide was there, and we were a small group, five or six of us, and he's sharing all these facts, but I couldn't hear anything that he was saying because all I could see in front of me Was God going, I have a plan, I have a will for this nation, and I just need somebody to speak to it. Speak strength rather than this be lame. Call it to be healed. Call it to be cured. No one knew I was there. Even the people that were hosting me didn't know what I was doing. Suddenly somebody tapped me on the shoulder and they said, Jen, the the guide is speaking to you. And I turned, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And He said, well, they tell me that you're a minister. And I I said, yes. And he said, would you like to go stand in the pulpit that John Wesley stood in? I said, yes, I would. As I made my, my way up there, I felt the hand of God upon me as much as I ever had before. Nobody knew what I was doing. And as I walked those stairs and stepped into that huge wooden pulpit, you know, they built them almost like a booth. And I stood there and I looked down and there was a Bible on the pulpit and it was opened. And it said, speak to the hands that hang down. Speak to the feeble knees. 
to that which is lame. Rather, let it be healed. And I stood in that pulpit with everybody looking, smiling. They're taking pictures. Smile, Jen. Smile for the camera. And as I stood there with no celebration, no gravitas, I just simply stood and out of my spirit flowed the words he had given me to say, after all, isn't that what prayer is? And I declared, Father, I speak strength to the hands that hang down of this government that is tr moving with your will and your plan for this time, that they will be strengthened. I speak to that which is lame, Father, and I speak rather let it be healed. Let it be cured. Let it be restored to soundness. Let the protective walking pattern be removed. Let it be made whole. I knew in those moments of quiet declaration that my assignment was done. And my spirit, as I walked down the stairs from that podium, I heard the Holy Spirit say, thank you. That's the real reason I brought you to Great Britain. Are we still a people that believe that every time we pray, things change? Are we still a people that believe that if the Lord would wake us up and say, get up and go to that elementary school and walk around that school, anoint it with oil, and quietly pray my word, do we still believe that like an iron dome, the protection of God can be resident there? Are we still a nation that believes that when God speaks, he's looking for a partner that will stand in the earth. Why? Because he will not violate the authority that he gave. That he's looking for a partner that will speak and change things. Isaiah chapter 35. Prophetic scripture about Jesus. It says, say to those with an ancient, anxious and panic-stricken heart, be strong and fear not. Indeed, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, and he will save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf be unstopped. Then, look at this, will the lame leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. This was a prophetic scripture about Jesus. Remember, Jesus answered the disciples of John the Baptist when they said, we have to give account for what's going on. What did Jesus say? Go tell them the things you see and hear. That the blind receive their sight, that the lame walk, and that they shout for joy. That's what we are here to do, to release the kingdom of heaven from heaven to earth because that is the citizens that we are of. We are here to release the cure. Second Chronicles chapter 7, we have heard it said, we've declared it from this very room and it's gone around the world and reverberated in the nations. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. In the face of opposition and chaos, adversity and setbacks, attacks and outright evil on display, we must remember that we are here to receive the cure. Don't settle for the limp. We're here to testify of the cure, to declare the cure, to be solutionaries and go about doing good. The last scripture I'll share is out of Zephaniah. Finishing that portion of scripture. It says, then he answered and speaking to me saying, this is the word of the Lord. And to Zerubbabel, he says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O mighty mountain, before Zerubbabel? For you will become level ground. And then it says, 
He will bring out the capstone to shouts of God. God bless it. God bless it. I'm going to ask for Rachel and the team to come. It says, then you will bring out the capstone to shouts of God. Bless it, God bless it. Just until this last week, I never knew this, but in our nation's capital, inscribed on the capstone of the Washington Monument, on the side facing the West, there is an inscription in Latin, and it reads, Leo Stau, which translates, praise be to God. No matter how the nations rage, no matter how our own nation rages, every single day when the sun sets in the west, the sun shines on the inscription on the capstone of our Washington Monument. Praise be to God. I don't know if you caught it this morning, but right at the end of our worship time, there was a phrase Rachel was leading us in, and it grabbed my heart, and we sang, praise the king, praise the king, let it ring. Let it ring from sea to shining sea. Let it ring from shore to shore. Let it ring from nation to nation. As the nations line up, 64 nations in national elections, don't let anybody tell you that it doesn't matter. The Spirit of God would call us this morning. Don't settle for a lame America. Don't settle for a lame nation. Don't settle for a lame state of things. Don't settle for the limp. But pick up the praise that reverberates through the generations. I think of a group of young people in the early, early 1900s, late 1800s. They gathered in a small, tiny church in Wales and said, is this all there is to Christianity? We can't settle for a lame version of this. And a small group of kids asked permission from the vicar if they could come at night and and sing songs and gather. And he said, sure, and they came on the first night, not much happened, but there was just enough curiosity that they came back the second night, and then they came back again, and they came back again. I've stood in that church where the Welsh revival was born. Nobody knew their names. But as they lifted their voice and praise, praise be to the king, a cure began to ring out. The last time I stood in that chapel, there was a man there, 98 years old. He said, my uncle was the song leader here. And part of my inheritance was one of the only recordings that exist of the song services in the beginning of the Welsh Revival. Would you like to hear it? I said, yes. And he played it for me. It sounded like a group that was in a Bible study. It's, if you listen to the sound, it sounded so insignificant. Who would think that the sound of the praise, the songs of those people would go around the world and change the world as we know it, but the sound of their praise came from a posture of their heart that they weren't praising from Wales out. They were praising from heaven down into Wales, and it changed Wales, and it changed the world. Let's not be the ones that settle for a lame America. Oh, but we speak the cure. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, we lift our voice this morning in this place. And we declare that you are the king. Lord, we lift our voice in praise to you. 
We lift our voice believing, Father, that when we pray, things change. We lift our voice this morning, Father, not just here from Middletown, Ohio, not just from all the places we're watching and gathering from, but we lift our voice, Father, first as citizens of heaven. And from heaven, we say, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. We speak praise to the king and we say, let America be healed. Let America be cured. We speak to the nations of the world and we speak for the movement of God in those nations and we speak healing to those nations. We speak to the putrefied waters and we say, be healed waters, be cleaned out. Corruption, evil governments fall. Let the spirit of the Lord rule and let him reign. Father, we thank you that even as it is written on the capstone of our nation, praise be to our God. Lord, we think of those people that sang that out when they first arrived and we pick up the sound of their cry and we say praise be to God once again. Praise be to your name once again. Oh, let's lift up our voices and just worship him. Let's praise him this morning. What an awesome word. That was awesome. Amen. God is talking to his church today. He's talking to his church today. Holy Spirit is saying things and through the message that Jen just gave and then of course this afternoon in the film that we're about to see, don't miss that, but fire fall, couldn't help. I mean, it's so obvious singing that line. 805 B.C. What did the prophet say? Just before, just a couple of hours before the fire fell on an altar. The prophet of God, Elijah. One of the premier prophets was prophesying what we're hearing today stood before that altar and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? We're hearing that halt means to walk with a limp, perfect. Sprained ankle, broken bone in your foot, or a rock in your shoe, that's what it means. Stop it, church. Perfect. That's what he's saying. Stop limping. Listen to what I'm saying, American church. And rise and do what I tell you to do. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Running with the Lord without a limp. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for this word today. You are obviously talking to the church. No halting, no hesitating, no uncertainness. Don't walk with a limp. Listen to my word to the American church. Listen, listen, listen. And then run with passion. Run, run faith. We will do so today. Our ears are open. We will continue to feast upon this and listen. And we will be expectant, Lord, to hear what you are saying this afternoon. So we give, we, we just give this atmosphere to you. Those that are coming in, Lord, may they feel the presence of King Jesus and know the Spirit of God is speaking to the church. In Jesus' name, we declare it, amen, amen. All right, we'll see you this afternoon. Bless you.